And I'm going to talk about um, Mobi data cleaning. Um, and the question here that we have experienced over the years is always like, how many ICs can we remove? How many ICs should we remove? When I talk about ICs, I talk about independent components. And most of the analysis um, that we are doing in our lab in Berlin is based on independent component analysis. I'm going to talk about that um, in a few minutes, um, very briefly. Taking these brain imaging methods that now allow, for example, like ICA, allow to dissociate brain and non-brain origins to your signal that you record with EEG, you can transfer that and basically utilize the mobility, the portability of lightweight small EEG amplifiers this is a setup for mobile brain body imaging that you can see here that we use in our lab in the Berlin, uh, Berlin Mobile Brain Body Imaging Lab. And um, you can see that we are using EEG um, in this case, but you can use any kind of mobile brain imaging device. And this is the point um, basically where we focus on today. Um, we're looking into ICA-based cleaning. <clears throat> As I said, ICA gives you um, several dimensions for each independent component, and this is basically described in the independent component properties. As you already saw, you will get the spatial filter for your IC, that is the scalp map. And again, this simply reflects how much each independent component, the activity somewhere in the brain or outside the brain, contributes to the signal that you record at the, or contributes to each of the sensors. Then you will get the time course of that IC. And there are additional information because once you have this beautiful dipolar pattern on the scalp, if an independent component is maximally independent and thus shares um, less mutual information with other ICs, the more dipolar the pattern becomes. And that was beautifully uh, shown um, in a paper by Arnaud Delorme um, and colleagues. Um, so using this dipolar pattern on the scalp, you can simply use a mathematical model, an equivalent dipole model, to reconstruct that origin. So ICA doesn't come with a location in, in the brain, it comes with a scalp map, but if the scalp map is dipolar, you can simply use that scalp map to reconstruct the sources in the brain using equivalent dipole modeling. So that's super convenient, very few assumptions only, and with those few assumptions you get additional information about the anatomical origin of the activity that you measure on the surface. And then, of course, you can have additional computations on the IC time course. For example, you can transform time course into frequency domain and you will get the spectrum. You can see that here. And you can simply look into the data, chop it up in, in time, just compare different stretches of data to see whether there is any systematic pattern in this data. And one recent tool that was added to the mix is IC Label, basically giving you a probability based on different dimensions of these ICs of what this IC, what kind of process this IC most probably represents. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. Okay, I will now dive into the different aspects, looking into the scalp map, how the scalp map basically um, um, comes out of ICA and what it tells you when you look at that. Then looking at IC label, the different probabilities, the classes that you can classify um, these ICs um, to, like brain, muscle, eye, others, line noise, whatever you have. And then you will have the time course. Um, this is very informative because you can compare that directly as it is synced with your EEG sensor pattern. You can compare it with your sensor data and you will see which IC contributes to what activity pattern in your sensor data. So that is very useful sometimes to simply have a look of what's going on in different ICs over different time courses and how that relates to the sensor data. <clears throat> then if you look into the continuous data, this is nothing but stacked color-coded amplitude over time. So just imagine you have like an ongoing EEG, you cut out a certain aspect of that EEG and then you have positive values being color-coded red. The more positive, the more um, saturated the red becomes. Negative values and amplitude become blue-ish and bluer, 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 the more negative they are. And so you basically just color-code each sample 
um, according to its amplitude, and then you have a color-coded time series that you stack on top of each other. If there is an event-related activity, you will see color bands basically appearing, reflecting. It's a different form of visualizing event-related activity, actually. And you will see some examples later. And then you will have um, the dipole location using equivalent dipole modeling. You can now come up with an approximation of where this IC pattern, the scalp map, basically your spatial filter, um, originates in the brain. And this is, of course, very useful because it gives you additional anatomical information. So now we are now certainly able to talk about, oh, there's activity most likely originating in parietal cortex or in occipital cortex or the Bereitschaftspotential that we're looking at uh, in the previous talk might be originating in motor cortex or premotor cortex. So this adds additional information that can be used to get a better understanding on, um, of the data and how it relates to cognitive function. And then in the end, of course, if you use time domain information and you use Fourier transform or wavelet, whatever, um, you can basically transform that into the frequency domain and you get additional information. For example, in which frequency band is the strongest activity visible in this component? And this helps you over time to dissociate what is brain and what is non-brain activity. We've seen in the previous days that muscle activity um, works in a very high frequency range. Due to the overlap of the motor unit potentials, you have a very high frequency activity that you measure in EMG activity, and that usually shows up in these kinds of um, power spectral pictures that i show you later also, um, with a very broadband, high power frequency distribution. And this is a clear indicator that this might not be brain. But be careful, um, it might not be as easy as it looks um, or sounds at this point. So, we're going to go through these different dimensions and I'm going to give you a few ideas and our perspective in Berlin, or more specifically my perspective um, in Berlin, um, how to interpret these results. So, this is um, the IC properties scalp map function. If you use the topoplot function in MATLAB, e.g. lab, you can plot all these different topographies. So in this case, we plotted 40 topographies. Um, and it depends on the number of channels. So you get as many ICs and thus as many scalp maps as channels that you put into um, the decomposition. If you have noisy channels that you interpolate because you remove them um, after being detected as noisy, you reduce the rank of the data. So you still have 60 channels, but if you interpolated two of them, you will get only 58 IC components because there is no additional information contained in these two channels as they were interpolated based on neighboring channel activity. No um, 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 information in itself that was carried in these channels. And what you can see here is that these ICs are usually sorted according to the explained variance in the sensor signal. So this is energy sorting, basically. And here you can already see that among the first 10 components or so, usually what you will find is eye movement activity. And you can see that here in IC4 and IC1, one is a vertical eye movement, um, and I'm going to explain you why this is the case later. And this is horizontal eye movement. Um, and you can see that after some time with experience, you know that the distribution of the scalp, um, of these scalp maps, tells you a little bit where the origin of this um, distribution pattern is. And um, for the vertical eye movement, that's obviously a very high weighting of the activity that you measure. Um, um, at the sensors for this IC, very frontally located. But it's only one pole that you can see that's covering the entire forehead, basically. Um, if you compare that to the horizontal eye movements, this is a clear dipolar pattern. You can see a positive and a negative pole. And obviously, I'm going to show that later. If you have two eyes in your head, these are two huge batteries with a ne negative resting state potential in the retina. If you move these two batteries, your negative pole moves to one side, making the right side negative 
and the left side that is non-charged, your cornea, positive. So whenever you move your eyes, this polarity pattern will change. In the spatial filter that you see here, in the um, decomposition, that won't change the stationary filter. Um, polarity is arbitrary. Okay, so and then you see tons of other components here. Um, and um, some of them are brain, like the 11 um, IC3. Some of them are muscles. Okay, so these are the scalp maps. If you look at the IC activity, then you see that there's tons of information in this. It's like a sensor um, activation time course, right? But now it is based on a maximally independent component. And if you look, for example, at IC1, the example that I just showed you before, the vertical IC, then you see that this independent component reflects perfectly blink activity that you also see in your sensors. In the sensors, you would see that across all sensors that are located frontally and then with less amplitude, the more posterior you move in the sensor space. This is all covered by the IC, basically showing that the frontal electrodes that are close to the eyes have a lot of energy in this for this IC scalp map and the further you move away the less energy these sensors contribute to this IC. So this is why you have this patch of red strong energy right at your forehead. And this is a time course. So if you compare um, this to the horizontal eye movement you can see that this is an uh, a entirely different time course. And the behavior here is more like a rectangular signal that you can see here. And this is the saccade. This is a rapid eye movement to one side and moving back. So you move to one side and it becomes like strong, a very fast movement here. And then it stays on that side and then it moves back. These movement parts here are very high frequency, very rapid. And then you stay, you move again, you look to a different location, and this is like this rectangular pattern that you usually have in an EOG if you place your electrodes to the left and to the right of the eyes. So this is reflected in IC activity. Now, I said um, this is um, a brain component, IC22. We've been talking about that. And here you can see this um, beautiful alpha activity. I'm, I'm a huge fan of alpha activity. And um, it is functional in the sense, and it is one of the dimensions that really helps you to dissociate brain from non-brain activity. And if you look at the sensor space now, and this is shown in the upper picture, then you can see a standard EEG recording. This is a stationary traditional desktop protocol. And what you can see is that people move their eyes because that is what we naturally do. Um, and eye blinks are related to cognitive function um, with increasing mental load you have an increase or decrease in eye blinks. You, you see usually that participants, if they know the relative structure of your experimental protocol, they will not blink when they know that an event will come up because they want to take up the information, right? So you suppress blinking because you rely on visual input. And once that information was given, you can blink. So that is usually why you see blinks after events in these standard protocols. And down here, what you can see is the IC activation pattern. IC1, that was the one that was reflecting the blinks, right? So, and what you can see is these are time aligned. You can see clearly in the EEG data that whenever there is a blink going on in the sensor space, that this component reflects this blink activity beautifully. Very nice. And what I'm doing now here is I'm just using channel data. This is FP1 and this is IC1. Scaling um, is arbitrary here. I see amplitude has no meaning in that sense. But what you can see in red is the activation time course of the vertical IC. And it fits perfectly the blink that you see in the EEG pattern. And if you now overlay that with the IC4, the um, um, horizontal EOG, you can see that whenever there's strong movement in the eyes to the sides, that that part is very well explained by the green IC time course here. So this is what I'm saying when I talk about use your IC activation time course to look and compare that to your EEG sensor data. You will see how much each of the ICs contribute to your sensor data. And in the case of eye movement, that is pretty obvious. For others, this might, be, this might be not that clear, but it's still helpful. Okay, 
The second dimension that you can use to decide whether you want to remove an independent component from your decomposition before projecting back and clean up your data is the power spectrum. And the power spectrum usually for brain components shows a very strong peak in the 10 hertz um, frequency range. And then what you also observe in most of the components is the classical 1 over F decrease in power. So with increasing frequency, you get a decreasing power. That's called the 1 over F function. And you see that in most of the components, um, save a few. Um, this is the prototypical um, motor mu activity that we see in this um, scalp map that I showed you, the motor um, um, scalp map. Um, so there is usually a strong 10 hertz and the first harmonic frequency band. In this participant, this is clearly shifted to a slightly lower frequency. So the peak frequency is somewhere around 8 hertz in this participant. And you might know or have read the Klimisch paper about individual alpha peak. Um, shifts, so there's huge differences between individuals and their peak in, in the alpha frequency range. So if you want to have like a very um, concentrated analysis on alpha activity, you should always determine the individual alpha peak before then adjusting the neighboring bands. And if you have an 8 hertz peak um, in alpha, then the first harmonic would not be 20, of course, but 16 hertz. So this is what you see here. And this is a very nice sensory motor component. Um, that we often observe in these kind of experiments. This is IC1, this is our vertical eye movement. Very steep 1 over F decrease here, and then it just stays um, on the same level. There's no power change anymore, and that's more or less the same for the horizontal IC. That's IC4 that I showed before. Okay, and then this is what I um, talked about before in the frequency domain. This is a muscle component. Um, it's IC9, um, and I um, might come back to that. What you see here is the prototypical muscle activity that has very broadband high frequency power. You don't see 1 over F here. There's no decrease in power with increasing frequency, but it actually ramps up around usually 20 hertz and then just stays there. So it ramps up 15 to 20 hertz and then it stays on this level. But in this component, this is a Mobi component actually, um, you see like an additional 10 hertz peak or close to 10 hertz. This is something that bothers us for some time now. We still have no clear explanation of what that actually is, but this 10 hertz is not indicative of a muscle actually, but would be indicative of more cortical origin. This is a very prototypical power, uh, power spe uh, spectrum for a muscle. And that's what I said, it ramps up around 15 to 20 hertz and then just stays there. There's no one over F decrease. Okay. And then we come to dipole location. And as I said before, this is very helpful in estimating where in the brain the um, activity originates, um, because that gives us additional anatomical location. So if you see a dipole located in this area, so this very much post uh, central gyrus here, so sensory motor area most likely, with an approximation. So we have to be careful, right? This is an estimate. It's a model-based reconstruction of the origin based on the scalp map. So there are model assumptions and we simply don't know ground truth. It's an ill post problem mathematically and there are infinite solutions to this problem. Without model assumptions, we can't reconstruct anything. But giving the assumptions and knowing what you're doing, you have an estimate, an approximation of where this dipole might be located. So usually we argue that the dipole is located in or near a certain cortical structure. We never use the exact coordinates that we get because, as I said, there is noise in this um, um, process. Nonetheless, you get an approximate anatomical location and with that you get anatomical function. And that helps you to explain why this component might act or the um, activity pattern that you see um, looks the way it does. So this is a simple um, field trip toolbox that's integrated in EEG Lab. That's also a free toolbox in, for MATLAB for using um, these dipole modeling um, approaches. And what you get is like for every single IC, you get a dipole um, with the location and the moment. These are standardized here. And you can, with that, basically extract the exact coordinates. MNI or Talairach, uh, whatever coordinate system is used. And you can then use um, clients on um, the internet or like downloadable apps um, where you can simply add your um, XYZ 
coordinates that you get from the dipole location and basically enter that to simply retrieve where in the brain this dipole is located to. Um, so this is very straightforward and this, in, in, in my perspective, puts EEG clearly up um, as an imaging method. We're not talking about sensor space only anymore. We're talking about independent activity that can be localized to specific brain regions. And that is um, um, the same information basically with some restrictions that we get from other imaging methods. So, in summary, what I showed you is we do have EEG data, continuous data, that is contaminated with tons of activity that we might not be interested in. Then we do some magic. Um, in this case, it's ICA. It's not magic at all. It's a mathematical model. It has assumptions and you have to check your assumptions. Whatever kind of model you use, you decompose the data, check the model assumptions and whether they work. ICA model assumptions seem to work largely and they allow dissociation of brain and non-brain, which is specifically of interest to MOBI um, data. Then basically using the information, making more objective pre-processing pipelines, classification of components, all that will be very helpful in getting a more objective approach to data analysis of complex data. And with that, you can clean your data, whichever way you want. And you have to ask a question how you want to do that. Do you want to focus on brain? Do you want to focus on ERPs? Do you want to focus on other aspects of the data? And what would that mean for your cleaning approach? And I think one of the most important points I'm trying to make here today is that there is not one cleaning approach, um, quoting Mansa Pesca. And this is specifically the case for mobile data as compared to stationary data. If you look at the same visual input that you see here, we have a monitor where, you, where participants basically rotated um, uh, according to a sphere moving around them. And we did that on a monitor. This is a traditional setup. And this is like the Mobi setup. Then it is obvious that there will be different contributions of eye and muscles to the signal. And this will result in different data quality and different event-related potentials. So be aware what you're doing and what you can expect in your experiments and the data. So data cleaning with ICA should consider what is analyzed. If you're interested in ERP, then I think it's fair to say eye movement or components that reflect eye movements are very well identified by ICA. You can remove that. It's a very good cleaning approach. If the signal can be potentially filtered um, to be less impacted by muscle activity, as Valentina said. 20 hertz filter might be harsh, 30 hertz filter. Again, muscle activity is broadband high frequency. If you can filter the data, you might not even have to remove components. So why think about removing muscle if you don't get that signal into your ERP? If a specific class on top of that is systematically related to the onset, which muscles might not be, right? So if, if it's not like a specific movement that every time happens with onset of stimulus, then muscle activity should not be time locked to the event. And in that case, should average out in the ERP, you might not have to remove those components. And if it's not event related, you might be careful with the removal. You might also simply keep them. If you don't know what it is, and that's a very conservative approach to it, if you can't identify what the IC does, if you don't know whether it's functional or not, it might be better not to remove it. And disclaimer, this is all my personal view. So there might be other opinions on that, but this is what we have learned over time from our data-driven approaches of more than 15 years mobile brain body imaging now. And I think um, this is one aspect you might consider. For time frequency analysis, if induced and power is of interest, then single trial high energy signals might be problematic. So muscle activity here now becomes a real problem. Um, and um, if the signal can be filtered again, this might not be a problem for you at all. You don't have to remove anything. If event related power is of interest, um, then I see that systematically vary with the onset of the event should be removed if they're non-functional for you, but be careful with removal if you're not really sure. So again, 
if the frequency is not of interest, you might filter or it might basically be averaged out across trials. If you're not sure, don't remove it. Okay, and with that, again, disclaimer, um, there's no one recipe for EEG analysis. I think we approximate um, with our Berlin pipeline to pre-process MEEG data uh, a very good objective way of analyzing and pre-processing data and cleaning data with Amica. Um, Amica has a very robust and very well working um, um, time domain cleaning, so log likelihood removal of um, um, data points that works am amazingly well. So um, you can use ICA to remove eye components because that is absolutely safe. Um, for anything else, you really have to consider what is the main question of your experiment, what do you want to answer. And as the end, uh, in the end, the message really is um, we have to replicate protocols, we have to share protocols, share your pipelines, share your data, so that other labs can replicate with different analysis approaches what we get from mobile brain body imaging data to come to robust descriptions of parameters. And so with that, um, I hope I could give you an insight, a different converging insight to traditional desktop analysis approaches coming from a mobile brain body imaging side. And I hope um, this is helpful for you in the future. Thank you.